This is On the Veterna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Johnny. A very good evening to you all. Thank you for taking the time once again to share your evenings with us right here on World News Tonight. Our neighbor in India seems to be a bit foggy. I will have that uh, story later on in the bulletin, but first... Former President Donald J. Trump cruised to an easy victory in the Iowa caucus, the lead of contest in the 2024 Republican presidential nominating calendar. Many television stations in the United States made a call for Mr. Trump half an hour after the caucus got underway across the Hawkeye state. The former president's lightning fast win in Iowa gives him a crucial early victory in his bid to return to the White House. Donald Trump muscled past his rivals to capture the first 2024 Republican presidential contest in Iowa on Monday. This has been an incredible experience. The people have been, this is the third time we've won, but this is the biggest win. The former U.S. president won the state's caucus by a record-setting margin over his closest opponent, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And I'm the guy that can do that. DeSantis edged past former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley after a tight race for second. Both were aiming for a strong second place finish to show voters and donors that their challenges to Trump remain viable. With 95% of votes tallied, Trump had 51%, while DeSantis was at 21% and Haley 19%, according to pollster Edison Research. The state's Republican voters had braved life-threatening snow and cold to back Trump, despite him facing four criminal cases that could go to trial before the November 5th general election. According to Edison Research, two-thirds of caucus goers think Trump would still be fit for president if convicted of a crime. Most also embraced Trump's falsehoods about voter fraud, with two-thirds saying they did not believe Biden legitimately won the 2020 election. The state was a political battleground between the GOP and the Democratic Party that supported Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. But it's now seen as a reliably red state in presidential elections, with registered Republicans edging out Democrats. Well, let's uh, get reactions to that story. And uh, following all the events of the Iowa caucus, is our Vedanasa Shanali, who's uh, stationed all the way in Toronto, Canada. Shanali, uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Now, a big night for Mr. Trump. Does this mean it's Trump all the way? Mahesh, it seems to be exactly as you have pointed out. Last night's caucuses have made it mostly clear exactly which strategy the Republican Party should be following if they are to plan a stronger standing in the long run. Donald Trump has demonstrated that it's still his Republican Party. It's important to note that Trump is kick-starting his bid to win his party's third consecutive presidential nomination despite skipping the GOP primary debates. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis edged out former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley for a distant second place finish. Though the nominating contest now shifts to New Hampshire where poll show Haley is in a much strong position in next week's primary. The results in Iowa demonstrated how devoted Republicans remain to Trump. Absolutely. Um, well, some interesting times ahead. Uh, New Hampshire is next. Um, next week itself and if by any chance Trump can pull that off as well it looks like it'll be a, a done deal for Trump. Um, Suzanne Shanali, I don't know, World News Special Correspondent reporting from Toronto, Canada. Thank you very much. Let's dive deep uh, into this conversation. Um, joining me now is uh, other Dharana's International Affairs Analyst Imran Furkan. Imran uh, has many hats and tonight he's uh, having the hat of uh, explaining the world to us, uh, actually explaining the, the U.S. elections. I think last time also you were here to analyze four years back uh, exactly. uh, the Trump-Biden uh, race and, and we were going through a lot of conversations on that. Now here we are again. It looks like another Trump-Biden rematch or does uh, Haley or DeSantis have a chance? But it doesn't look like uh, after last night. Yes, I, I think it was Trump's uh, race to lose always. Um, and what you see um, in, in Iowa is that uh, the base is very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, the base is behind him. 
Um, and I think uh, now the race is moving forward in terms of actually him and Biden really going after each other. We'll, we'll have the you know a couple of other primaries and so on for the sake of having them, but uh, really nothing. But much do, do you say. think there's no way DeSantis or um, Haley has a chance to pull through because New Hampshire is where Haley is counting on, hoping that she would actually surge. She was also hoping last night's performance she would actually become the second uh, um, to uh, Trump, but that didn't happen. So, what are the prospects for an uh, uh, individual like Haley? We can forget about Ron DeSantis, but uh, Nikki Haley. Yeah, I think uh, if you look at the um, if you look at the, what has happened with in terms of the um, you know the, the the counties, there are 99 of them. And DeSantis went to all 99 of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, uh, you know Trump has won 98 of them, and Haley's uh, leading one. Um, but also, I think if you look at some of the other issues, right? Um, if you look at some of the other issues, what concerns the voter, mm -hmm. the, the the you know the uh, the Republican uh, in in Iowa? Um, if you look at the four main issues, right? Foreign policy, abortion, immigration, and economy, you'll see that um, on, on immigration, which is a big worry on the southern border, Trump is way ahead of yeah. other, other candidates. On the economy, he's also way ahead. Look, I mean, it's 52%, but the others don't even have 20%, right? Um, on abortion, uh, the evangelicals are with, with him um, because, you know, he put uh, judges that, that favor, um, you know, restrictions on abortions. Only on foreign policy does he, you know, Nikki Haley is a bit ahead, and that is because she was the UN, um, US UA ambassador to the UN and appointed by Trump yeah, itself. Yeah, exactly. So but these are uh, the issues. That, that's the thing. Now, if you look at this chart, immigration and economy, these are the two more, uh, main factors for the Republicans. But it's not just the Republicans. If you look at the Democrats and if you look at the people all across America, those two uh, uh, factors, immigration and economy, is, is very crucial to them. Uh, the, I mean, not foreign policy or abortion. Those were conversations that they, they used to have in, in, in uh, previous elections. But in this one, economy takes takes the cake. Absolutely. And uh, the economy has always been the key issue in American elections. And, and this year, the issue is with the cost of living, which is very high globally, but in yeah. America as well. Inflation is coming down, but uh, the cost of goods and services are very high. And therefore, Americans feel their purchasing power is much lower. And because the, they feel that, um, even though the inflation is coming down by November, unless it, you know, uh, co the cost of goods and services come down, they won't feel as if they are yeah, it's benefiting yeah. them, right? The statistics it, it's the same are there. story here as well um, in, in Sri Lanka. Let's talk uh, a little bit about this immigration. Yes. Now, immigration has become a headache. Yes. Let's, for hypothetically, say it's a rematch between Trump and Biden. I have doubts because I'm not sure whether Biden would actually pull through health-wise <laughs> till November, but whatever said and done, let's say it's, it's a rematch between Trump and Biden. Trump loses, uh, actually, Biden loses in all those fronts, whether it's foreign policy, America is not respected the way it was respected prior, abortion, uh, maybe he might score a little bit of marks there, immigration completely failed, I mean, millions of people are just crossing into America illegally, um, economy not done well as well, and Bidenomics, I think, is what he pitched, but that didn't work as well. So. Has the Democratic Party accepted the fact that uh, Joe Biden is going to be a one-time president? Well, that's a good question, a very good question, actually. Um, I think for them, the issue is um, when you have an incumbent president, it's very difficult to nominate somebody else yeah. while that person is there, right? Because the power of incumbency is a very powerful one. You can influence policy, right? Um, and and um, particularly on immigration and the economy, there's 10 months more for the election. So that's a yeah. long time in politics. Anything can happen. Um, Trump could be you know, uh, convicted in one of those counts that he does. And maybe- But that still doesn't stop the fact that he's t he, he will be taken out uh, from the race, right? Because, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, the United States Constitution says that even though he is even in prison, he still can run. The only factor is that you need to be a citizen of the United States of yes. America. Is that is that accurate? Uh, well, generally, yes, because there have been people who have run from prison. So <laughs> I think it's possible. Um, the only, you know, uh, clarification is the 14th Amendment, which talks about insurrection. And, and you know, uh, some of the states, Colorado. But that case is coming way really. It's ca uh, Yeah, but it's coming up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court will decide within the next few weeks, I'm sure, whether he can run. And it seems... Highly unlikely. Uh, yeah. yeah. But the, what I don't understand is this. 
uh, insurrection um, would be a factor if if all the other people in his particular party at that particular moment, who, whoever supported Trump uh, um, on, on, on the January 6th uh, affairs, the riots, they were not convicted. Not one single person has been convicted on the grounds of insurrection. So how come the president can be uh, the person who needs to be uh, held accountable or, or you know, come after? So it, it clearly um, steers the conversation away from this and it comes down to this, uh, you know, Asian concept going after your rivals kind of kind of story. Yes, it is. Um, only thing is the clarification. See, um, the Fourteenth Amendment doesn't really require court conviction. Um, so that that is because it was cre created for civil war times, right? Yeah. So it's, it was very exactly. clear. Yeah. But it, it, it seems highly unlikely the Supreme Court will allow that to continue. I think they will let him run because ultimately the people will decide who needs exactly. to run. So I, I, I doubt it's a big issue, but it is still an issue till it's clarified. So that's a couple of weeks from now. So I think if you ask about you know whether it gives uh, time for Biden, uh, sorry for Haley and and for DeSantis, this a little bit will, but by the 5th of March, I think we have Super Tuesday. Uh, I think by that time it will be pretty much done. Uh, Imran, in terms of uh, for the Republican Party, they need to mend fences and you know make sure that they come together with one particular cohesive messaging um, in order to go for the general election. Whom, whomever, whether it's Biden or whoever, that will be put forward by the Democrats. Uh, for the Republicans, if you look at it, does it make sense for them to understand? Yes, it is Trump. The nomination will go to him. So let's let us all just stop all this, not stop the process, but you know, let's stop the bickering and the rhetoric and come together and actually show a formidable front from the Republican Party that would actually help them catapult in, in November. I think it's already started, right? Vivek uh, Ramaswamy has yeah. dropped out of the case, uh, out of the competition, and he has now, uh, you know, endorsed Trump. Um, uh, even DeSantis and, and Haley, I think, um, never have never said that they will not endorse Trump, which means that they will, you know, probably. Um, uh, I, I honestly don't think it's a big issue with the Republican Party. They're quite united. Um, and there was polls today um, uh, talking to voters who voted for uh, others, Haley and, and DeSantis, whether they will vote for Trump when he, if he's the eventual nominee. And they said yes, very much so. So I think from the Republican side, actually, it's not a big deal. They, they, they usually come together. Um, and there isn't a polarizing, you know, equal mm. candidate to Trump. These are lightweights. <laughs> Indeed, it's going to be some interesting months, uh, not only in uh, the United States, but here in Sri Lanka as well. Absolutely. We are heading for our own presidential 50 election. 50 percent of the world is going for elections this year. So. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Imran Fulkan, thank you very much uh, for, for this, uh, you know, we'll be having many conversations on this subject as, as time passes, especially next Tuesday, um, a super, uh, what do you call, uh, when New Hampshire, do you think uh, uh, very quickly um, uh, Haley has a chance to pull through in New Hampshire? Um, win? No. But come very close to Trump? Possibly. Um, but we have to see, because what happens is now, the polls today or before today's competition showed her at 30%, and he met about 40, 45%. But what happens is Vivek's votes will go to Trump, and also there will be a reassessment by the voters themselves whether they want to a real competition. Um, funding would start drying up for DeSantis and, and Haley. Haley. Um, so I think uh, even though it's only a week from now, a week is a long time in politics. Imran Furkan, other than uh, World News uh, International Affairs Analyst, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. <laughs> Well, uh, more news uh, from the U.S. presidential election. Republican and former biotech executive Vivek Ramaswamy dropped out of this year's U.S. presidential race after his long shot bid caught attention but failed to catapult him high enough in Iowa. Ramaswamy, who's just 38 years old, endorsed Trump and said that former president was uh, an America first candidate who would have his full support. Now, this is what he said soon after he announced his campaign's end. Watch. We've looked at it every which way, and I think it is true that we did not achieve the surprise that we wanted to deliver tonight. And I think that that's just a hard fact that we're going to have to accept as a campaign. As of this moment, we are going to suspend this presidential campaign. And this is going to have to be, there is no path for me to be the next president, absent things that we don't want to see happen in this country. And I think that I am very worried for our country. I think we are skating on thin ice as a nation. And 
now going forward, he will have my full endorsement for the presidency. We're going to take a short commercial break. More will you right after this. Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Now, a large patch of dense fog shrouded the entire Indo-Gangetic Plain region stretching from Pakistan up to the Bay of Bengal in the east. Now, air travel and ground movements uh, have come to a standstill in the Indian capital and officials fear that the cold weather might drop into double digits in the next few days. Flight and train services were disrupted in several Indian cities for the second consecutive day as dense fog and cold enveloped large swathes of the northern part of the country. At least 463 flights leaving Delhi were delayed and 87 flights were cancelled according to the aviation website FlightRadar24. More than 500 flights were delayed in Delhi prior. According to railway documents, at least eight trains to Delhi from different parts of the country were running late because of the dense fog. Traffic moved slowly on the roads as commuters and students made their way to work and schools amid low visibility. The country's weather office has predicted dense fog and cold wave in New Delhi and a very dense fog today with a minimum temperature of 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit. There's an update in that Boeing story which we reported uh, uh, last week. Boeing has said that it will add further quality inspections for the 737 MAX planes after a mid-air blowout of a cabin panel in Alaska Airlines MAX 9 earlier this month. In a letter to the global plane makers employees, Stan Deal, the president of Boeing Commercial Airplanes, said that the company would also deploy a team to supply Spirit Aero Systems, which makes the, and install the plug door involved in the incident, to check and approve Spirit's work on the plug before fuselages are sent to Boeing's production facilities in Washington state in the U.S. Boeing's uh, quality inspection announcement comes after the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration said on Friday that all 737 MAX 9 planes should remain grounded until Boeing provides further data following the near-catastrophic Alaska Airline incident. Well, who managed to sweep the Emmys? That story coming right up after this break. This is World News Tonight. We'll be right back. Welcome to World News Tonight. Now, the 75th Annual Primetime Emmy Awards are a wrap. The awards were finally presented four months after they were originally scheduled to be held. Now, hosted by the former Blackie star Anthony Anderson, the awards were held at the Peacock Theatre in L.A. The bear and succession won big. Winners had the crowd on their feet with their emotional speeches. And we got some iconic TV reunions. Here's everything that went down at the 75th Primetime Emmy Awards. Anthony Anderson served as the night's host and celebrated the greatest shows of today while paying tribute to some iconic series throughout the years. Temporary layoffs. Easy credit ripoffs. The tribute even featured a special guest on the drums, Travis Barker. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Now let's get to the winners. Early wins of the night included Jennifer Coolidge for Best Supporting Actress in a Drama Series for The White Lotus, Matthew McFadden for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series for Succession, Quinta Brunson for Lead Actress in a Comedy Series for Abbott Elementary, making her the first black comedy lead actress winner in more than 40 years. Thank you so much. Just, I don't even know I'm so emotional. I think like the Carol Burnett of it all. <laughs> and a sweep for The Bear with Evan Moss Backrack, Jeremy Allen White, and Iowa Debery all winning in their respective categories. Probably not like a dream to emigrate to this country and have your child be like, I want to do improv, but... Um... As for memorable moments of the night, Anthony Anderson's mom played people off the stage when they were over their limit. I love you, baby, but time. Okay, guess what? <laughs> guess what? what? The cast of several iconic shows, such as Sopranos and Cheers, served as some presenters for the night, reuniting on a makeshift set of their series. Trevor Noah finally ended John Oliver's Emmy-winning streak by taking home outstanding variety talk series. We did it! 
We got rid of John Oliver. Elton John, who was not in attendance, just became an EGOT after earning his Emmy for Best Variety Special Live. And there was a special Emmys edition of SNL's Weekend Update featuring Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. I'm Tina Fey, and we've reached the stage in life where we'll only present awards sitting down. Elsewhere, this year's Governor's Award was given to GLAAD, and the In Memoriam was performed by the Warren Treaty and Charlie Puth with a special additional musical tribute to Matthew Perry. Cause you're there for me soon. Back to the winners, Stephen Yun and Ali Wong won for lead actor and actress in a limited series for Beef. Kieran Culkin and Sarah Snook won for lead actor and an actress in a drama series for Succession. And as for the big wins, The Bear won Best Comedy Series and Succession won Best Drama Series. Well, can't find good fertilizer for a bountiful crop? Why not try pea cycling? Welcome to the world of pea cycling, where urine is not considered waste, but liquid gold. That organization is called the Rich Earth Institute, and Abe oh, Noe Hayes is its co-founder, well, along with Kim Nace. People are usually a little taken back, but then I just kind of, I give them the real quick, there's nutrients in your urine, and we are figuring out how to capture those and use them in agriculture. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other trace minerals that come through our body as we eat our food and then use the toilet. Researchers around the U.S. and the world are studying urine recycling in Sweden, in Switzerland, in France, and in South Africa and other countries. And the Rich Earth Institute regularly offers educational webinars. If you are taking nutrients out of the ground, you need to be replenishing those nutrients in some form or another. A lot of pea cycling is still in the research and development phase. A pH of 4.66. But Kim Nace and Abe Noe Hayes imagine a bright yellow future. We're not asking people to do something this difficult. You just use the toilet. That thing you just did, that was great. You know, that you made something useful and you made something that's going to do good in the world. You're like, oh, really? I did? Oh, yeah. If all the environmentalists just stop pr protesting and just go pee on a tree, perhaps we can solve climate change. I don't know. Maybe just a good idea. Well, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with another edition of World News tonight. See you then. Bye.